Amen. Let's, you're there in Psalms chapter 12. Let's look at verse 6 again. Tonight I want to preach on why you can trust your King James Bible. Why you can trust your King James Bible. Now, I'm not in the audience, so I'm going to need some ameners here, okay? I need some people to back me up. Amen. Psalms chapter 12. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> verse 6. The words of the Lord are as pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now tonight, I, you guys have heard my messages before. Normally I try to make one good point. And I hammer that point home all the way through, right? You add stories, you add illustrations, you add verses, you add this and that, but it hits one point, right? One point, short, quick, and you get the one point. Now tonight, I'm not going to be able to do that because the King James Bible, I can make a point about it. I did that in the, my last sermon, but I'm going to have to tell a story. One long story of how the Bible came to us. Because it's not just one point or not just one fact of how the Bible came to us. It's a story of thousands of years of the making of God's Word. It's very interesting. I want to tell the story of how the King James Bible came to us. And I'm going to start with the story of the Old Testament. we got the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's divided up about maybe like this. Big Old Testament. Got a small little bit of New Testament. How did all this Old Testament come to us. Now the Old Testament, it was written by men, many different authors from different backgrounds. Now there was one author, right? One author, God. He inspired men to write down his words. He used many tools, different men, many tools to write down his words, to pen God's word. Turn to Exodus chapter 31 with me. <laughs> we see men are used by God to write God's word. But in one place in the Bible, we even see God writing God's word. God himself writes the word. He doesn't use a tool this time. He uses his finger. In Exodus chapter number 31, in verse number 18, we find God himself pens part of the Bible. In verse 18, we find the context here is he's given the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are being given and Moses doesn't have a little notebook in his, in his jacket. So God decides to take tables of stone, tables of stone, and pin the words on it. It says in verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. How cool is that? I mean, you could just take it home, put it in a little, put it in the corner of your room, right? A little table of stone. God wrote on this. That's a really cool monument right there. Now, right there, you have God writing God's word by himself with his finger. But he used other means as well. In the Old Testament, some of the men were moved by the Holy Ghost, and sometimes they were writing down what they heard audibly. Sometimes it wasn't the Holy Ghost moving in them. Sometimes it was their literal ear hearing what God was speaking. They were literally writing down the words they heard. Right Now, turn to Second chapter. Second Peter chapter number one with me. We're going to look at a famous verse about inspiration. And I just took a class on the inspiration and preservation of the scriptures in the King James Bible. And so there is a difference, but they're very similar. Inspiration and preservation. You can't have preservation without inspiration, inspiration without preservation. They go together in the King James Bible. The men were used of God to pin the scriptures. And they were all from all walks of life. That's the interesting thing about it. In 2 Peter chapter 2, or chapter 1, in verse 21, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost were, was moving men, moving them and telling them what to say. So when they wrote it down, it wasn't them saying it. It was God saying it. Just like when I write something, if I were to write, Hi, this is Luke. I didn't literally write that. The pen technically wrote it. If I wrote it, we'd be looking at my fingers wondering what was on there. The pen technically wrote it, but I was the author, right? God wrote the Bible because it was his words. He used men who used pens or quills to technically write it, but the author is God, correct? And the men, were used, the men that were used of God, they were from all walks of life. Here's the interesting thing. You have a book. 
I don't know how long your Bible is. Mine's very long. It's about a thousand pages. Let's see here. Yeah, mine's around... It's a lot of pages. Around a thousand. I don't know how, my, how long you guys' are, but a big book has a lot of words in it. A lot of words. I mean, if you've ever read through the Bible through, you know it takes a long time to read through the Bible. Months. I mean, if you read nine chapters a day, what do they say? Three months, I think? Or maybe it's a year. I can't remember. Some, somehow, if you read... I think it was a year. Yeah. Nine chapters a day will get you through once in a year. Maybe three months. I can't remember. But there's a lot of words in the Bible. For all those words to not have a contradiction, that's a serious feat, especially when the authors, like David, you have, he wrote 73 of our Psalms. He was a musician. He was a warrior. He was a soldier, a king, a husband, a father, a shepherd, a son. Comes from so many different things. He wrote 73 of our Psalms. But you also have Amos over here, a cattle rancher. You know, a guy with a cowboy hat on a horse. I don't know if he was quite that tight, but he kept cattle. You have Paul. He's a Pharisee, religious leader. And then you got other guys out there. You know, you got James and John, what, the sons of Zebedee, fishermen. All these different guys write parts of the Bible. And yet none of it contradicts each other. You see a little bit of difference each time. You know, Paul, he ends his epistles certain ways. And we know, oh, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Oh, that was Paul's epistle, right? And then you get certain guys, they have certain phrases of speech, but they all don't contradict. And that's good because we know God was the author. Now, there's 40 different authors from very different backgrounds. And here's the real thing. They didn't all come together and be like, all right, Paul's like, hey, David, how you doing? All right, we're going to make a book here. It's going to be called the Bible. Hey, Moses, come over here. All right, yeah, so let's get together. We, get, we can't let any contradictions happen. Hey, Adam, come on over here. We're going to make a book. No. These guys lived thousands of years apart. Thousands of years. I mean, they, the, the Adam to Paul was way back when. Paul to us is way back when, right? Paul never met Adam. Paul never met Moses, but their writings don't contradict because it was one author, God. Now, the story of the New Testament is very similar. Story of the New Testament. We have eyewitness accounts in the New Testament of Jesus' life. And here's the interesting thing. We have four accounts. Four accounts. Why do we get four? You know, John was written that we might believe. Luke gave a detailed account. He was a doctor, so he gave very, very detailed, acu uh, detailed, ac detailed facts. That's, what, that's the word I was looking for. I was accurate facts. There we go. And then Mark, he was giving you the quick story. 16 chapters. Just bam, 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 bam. That's the story of Jesus right there. I, I love his style. And then you got Matthew over here. He's speaking to the religious crowd, the Jews, right? He's telling them why Jesus is the Messiah. So you get four different accounts. They don't contradict. They all go together. And that's because there was one Jesus. They saw him from all different angles. They were speaking to different audiences. So you get a book to each different audience. That's nice. And the great thing about it is they don't contradict proving what they saw was the real thing. Just like the police, right? They come to you. They ask you. They write down the story. Next officer comes. He's like, hey, can I get that story again? And they compare it. Oh, there's, there's a difference there. All right, let's go ask them about that. And they go and get you on that thing to find out the truth, right? Well, the truth is they had four officers going and asking Jesus different things. They found out about his life. They went and wrote down their stories, and they all matched. That's because that's, that's what happened, right? Now, we have eyewitness accounts of Jesus in the New Testament. It was written by doctors. Anybody here a doctor? I don't think we have any doctors tonight. Lawyers. I'm glad we don't have any lawyers in here. And we, get, we got religious leaders. Our religious leader is gone. What are we going to do? And then we got anybody a Jew in here? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> we got doctors, lawyers, religious leaders, Jews, Greeks. Are any of us Greeks? I think we're all heathens. Okay. All right. <laughs> Never mind. Apostles. There's an apostle next door if you want to see her. Uh, tent makers. Carpenters. I mean, we got all kinds of different guys right in the Bible. The New Testament. All kinds of, all different walks of life. And it doesn't contradict, which is really awesome. You know why? If it contradicted, could there have been one author? God? Now, there could have been one man author. He could, and man, men do contradict themselves, but God doesn't, because God cannot lie. That's right. And so if it does not contradict, but yet it's written over such a long time period by so many different men, and God says, I wrote it, that would be, a, that would be proof that the Bible is true. Now, the means of inspiration, I have five main points, five things I want to go over. First was the Old Testament. Second is the New Testament. Third would be the means of inspiration and preservation. Now, inspired. In my college class, they made me memorize two words, inspired and preserved. They're similar and different. Inspiration 
and preservation. Let me erase this real quick because this has nothing to do with anything. There we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Luke. And um, inspired means directed by the Holy Spirit. So when you're inspired, when the writers were inspired, means they were directed by the Holy Spirit. Now, preserved, when we say the Bible is preserved, it means kept free from corruption or destruction. Now, the antonym of inspired might be expired, but inspired is directed by the Holy Spirit. So, holy men of old were, di were directed by the Holy Spirit on what to write. And then, the words they wrote were preserved for a long, 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 long time. Thousands of years. Now, you all know who had the first canning factory, right? It was Noah, because he had a boatload of preserved pears. Remember that. Preserved. The, <laughs> the God's word was preserved. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Here's another good verse on preservation. Because a lot of people nowadays, they believe in the inspiration. They believe, you know, Paul wrote whatever, he, you know, Galatians, for example. He wrote that book, and the paper he wrote it on, those words were inspired. But, you know, as they copied it down, it started getting a little bit, you know, a little bit off from the original, and now we got like, you know, it's sort of like the original, and it's not inspired, or it's inspired, but it's not preserved. You know, only the originals were inspired. That's what some people think. But the problem with that is because we read earlier in Psalms chapter 12, in verse 7, it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. He's talking about the words. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So if we believe the Bible, if we believe God's promise there, then there is the word of God on this earth somewhere. He preserved it on this earth. Where is it? In the King James Bible right now. Now, we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Here's a great example of inspiration. In verse 16, 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration. The way we got our scripture was through inspiration of the Holy Spirit and some men to write what God wanted them to write. Now, here's an example of preservation. I just read it. Psalms chapter 12, verse 7, it says, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's going to preserve his words. Now, a lot of Christians, I told you, believe in the inspiration of the originals, but they don't believe in the preservation of God's word. They don't believe in the preservation. They believe it was inspired right then, but they don't believe it was preserved down to where we are. They think, you know, you know the message, it's close enough. It's good. You know, I like the way the Living Bible is. You like it. That doesn't mean it's God's word. You know, oh, then you know the NASB, whatever, the New American Standard Version. You know, that's pretty good. But we want the perfect Word of God. We want the Word of God that was preserved. Because it says, forever, O Lord, thy Word is settled in heaven. It says, thou shalt keep them, thou shalt preserve them. So my question is, if God preserved His Word, where is it preserved? He used many men of old. He used priests to preserve them. I want to share something about the Masoretic text. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. Some of you, I'm sure Brother Morgan knows about it. The Masoretic text, it's interesting. I always heard the term, but it wasn't until my college class that I figured out who and what the Masoretic text was. You know, it was a text that was kept safe for thousands of years by these scribes. And their life calling, all they did was make sure that word of God did not get changed at all. Not even a period. Not a jot or a tittle. Not, not one bit. No, not. You know, they took their copies. For example, if I want to copy this, I, they copied it exactly. They made sure the letter A, 15 centimeters down and 16 centimeters over, was right there on the next page. I mean, it was exact copying. They would count diagonally and make sure all the letters matched up. They would find the middle letter. They would make sure that matched up with the new one. They would find the middle word and make sure it matched up. Because if they missed a word, it wouldn't be the middle word. So they found the exact one. They counted the words. They counted the letters. They counted the middle letters. They counted diagonally every which way. And they spent hours, days, years, their whole lives on making sure the word of God got preserved. They preserved it all the way down. The Masoretic text is very, very interesting because it doesn't match up with all these other phony baloney Bibles, right? It matches up 
with the King James because the King James was preserved. God's word is preserved. Now, number four, a direct link to the originals. Here's what I really wanted to focus a lot of time on. The direct link to the originals. You say, okay, we got God's word right here. But it'd be nice if we could compare it to Paul's writings. If we could take Galatians, be like, all right, let me see Paul's original writings here. Oh, it looks old. Okay. Oh, yeah, it matches up. That'd be nice, right? Well, we have almost as good. I want to share with you how good of, how good of a translation they did here and how close it is, just like one generation away from being compared with the originals themselves. Now, the Old Testament, we all know, was finished by the birth of Christ. It was finished 400 years before the birth of Christ. We know that because Christ spoke of the law, the prophets, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And that was the Old Testament. Christ spoke of them. So if he spoke of something, it had to be done by then. The New Testament was finished by 145 AD. We know that because there was a Syrian translation of the New Testament. Now, they couldn't translate something into Syrian if it wasn't there, right? They can't translate something that's not there into Syrian. So, had to be finished by 145 AD. Just a little bit of logic. We know that the 145 AD was a Syrian text called the Peshitta. It's a really, really hard word to remember, but it's a good one to remember for someone who's like, you know, I just like this, you know, what is it? Living version, living Bible. I like the Amplified Bible. All these different versions they got. I always love the Amplified one. <laughs> you get the Amplified Bible, but they got all these different versions, but they don't really have a direct link to the originals like the King James has. The Peshitta was a Syrian translation from the originals into Syrian. Now, do you know what they used to translate into English. They used a lot of manuscripts, but one of them, believe it or not, was the Syrian Peshitta. So that establishes a link, just one generation away. It's like, like, it's like the grandpa of the King James, right? Its dad was the Peshitta, its dad was the originals. That establishes a link, that this is like the grandson of the originals themselves. Isn't that pretty amazing? Now look at this. The Syrian tra translation, the Peshitta, was translated in Antioch. Now, if you know your Bible real good, you'll remember that's where they were first called Christians, in Antioch. Now, Antioch was where they had one of the apostles' churches. And they, had, they made there about 350, we find now, 350 different Peshitta manuscripts, which is what the Syrian church has used all down through the ages. They've used this Peshitta manuscript in Syrian, which was translated out of the Greek that it was originally written in. Now, Tertullian, we don't place too much faith in what secular writers wrote, but this guy does have some interesting insight. In 208, which is after this translation was written, he said the apostles' original churches were still around and that the original manuscripts they wrote, you know, like the letter to, the, letter to the Galatians, the letter to Ephesus, the letter to Colossae, the Colossians, you know, all those letters, they were still around. He referenced them because they were still around. They were in the churches at those cities. Those churches were still around in 208, B, 208 AD. So just 208 years after Christ, those churches were still around. And that's only a few years after the 145 when that Syrian translation was made. So if the church was around in 208, that means it was around in 145. I mean, the church can't die and then reopen at 208. So it had to be around at 145. Now, if those original manuscripts were still intact in 208, that means they were still intact in 145. Are you following me? That means when they translated the Peshitta, they probably didn't want to translate it off of a copy, right? They're going to go back to the original source. They're in the same city. At the church they go to is the original manuscripts. They're going to translate it out of the original or very, very close copy. I mean, those Masoret, Mas, Masoretic text guys, they're around. They can come over and be like, oh, yeah, that oh, no, middle word doesn't match up. Go, go, go redo that, right? So that translation, the Peshitta, was insanely perfect. I mean, it was right there with the originals. If there was any difference, the Christians could have been like, hey, I got the originals right here. Look at this letter right here. It's a little bit old, a couple 50 years old or so, but that doesn't match up. It was right there. So they could make sure that was, that was right. And, you know, we know the Christians back then, what were they doing? Searching the scriptures daily. So they would find things like that 
and fix them. But the good thing was the scribes were very accurate. So the Syrian text, the Peshitta, was came right out of when the originals were around. It was passed down very carefully because this is the word of God we're handling. This is ain't old, any old book. So they passed it down very carefully until it came down to about 1611. It's a really obscure date. Nobody here knows about 1611. But there were some guys that you guys never heard about. There's some scholars. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> the Syrian text, the Peshitta, came out of the originals. Now let me write it down here. You got the originals here. I'm not up here preaching because I got good, good penmanship. So the originals, out of here comes this word. The Peshitta. And that's the Syrian text we got here. And then out of the Peshitta in 1611 comes a Bible that a lot of people have heard about. The NIV. I mean, I mean King James Version. Not the NIV, right? The Living Bible. No. What comes out of that? The King James Version. So we got Grandpa up here. We got his son. We got Dad. And then we got Grandson right there. I mean, literally one step away from coming right out of the originals. Now, the originals, we don't have those anymore, do we? But we have second best thing. We have something that's so close and so perfect and so accurate that we can trust the King James Bible. It's amazing how close we were from having the exact originals themselves. Now, the new versions don't have this, do they? No, they don't like this manuscript because this manuscript, it happens to line up with the King James Version. And they don't like that because they can't make any money off of the King James Version. So what do they have to do? They don't like to tell people about this one. No, 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 we don't want to talk about that one. We want to talk about all these other ones, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus and all these great old versions. They don't like the Peshitta. No, they don't like that very much. But let me tell you what. The Bible is the preserved Word of God. Preservation is important. Because if you don't have preservation, then do we really have God's Word? If we don't have God's perfect Word, then what is this promise doing over here in Psalms chapter 12? Should we just take that promise out? I mean, they do. They do. They change the verse before. They change it to where it's not saying He's going to preserve His words. It says, Thou shalt keep us, O Lord. Right? Like, keep us, instead of his words. Instead of, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, and thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's preserved his words. Now, my last point is, the perfect, inspired, and preserved King James versus the new versions. And now, I'm sure you guys have all heard. Brother Fan has done sermons on this. I've done sermons on it. All you guys have done sermons on this. The differences between the King James and the new versions. I mean, it's astounding. I'm amazed at how many differences there are. And I mean, we all know about it, but everybody else doesn't. We tell them and it's like, oh, I never heard that. And you're like, where, you've been? where have you been? I mean, have you compared them? And so when you get a parallel Bible, it shows you how wicked those people were. You know, I was just reading the other day. I should have brought the quote with me, but it was the, I'm pretty sure it was an editor and he wrote the preface for the ESV. Might have been English Standard Version. But he was saying how alarming it is, how many things they took out. And he was saying he feels, he feels guilty for taking it out. He's scared of God now. I, I need to bring the quote and show you guys. It's frightening. I read it and I was like, whoa, this guy, nothing good, nothing good is about to happen to him. He does not have a bright future for taking so much out. And he knows it too. He was part of the wickedness of taking words out, taking doctrine out, and now he's scared. And he should be. He should be. Now, I want to give you tonight, though, seven fruits. I'm going to go over this real quick. Seven fruits of leaving God's word for these new versions. You know, I remember something. I mentioned it on the way here. Rehoboam, right? He was the king, and he had some counselors. He had some old guys, and he had some new guys. Now, our discussion today was not quite about anything important. It was about polka dot shirts, and that I said I was going with the young men's um, ideas, and I didn't want to go with the old men's council, my dad, so he, we, we were kind of like making jokes about that, but I'm sure I could find an old guy around here who likes polka dot shirts. Can, can I get an amen? I'm kidding. Okay, so Rehoboam, though, he had some old counselors, and he had some young counselors. Now, these new versions, they're the young versions, but they're wrong. They're dead wrong. Now, the old version is here for a reason. You know, the, the interesting thing is 
a couple hundred years ago, there was some competition for the King James. But you know, that competition's gone. I think it was the revised version and a few others that were like competition. A lot of people got them. But those are, those are gone. Nobody has them anymore because everybody sees, you know, those aren't the Word of God. And this is. This is standing the test of time. Everybody still uses the King James. Now, there's new versions coming up, but they're going to fall away. A new versions are going to come up. They're going to fall away. But this will stand the test of time because it's the Word of God and He promised to preserve it. Now, seven fruits of the Word of God. I had to alliterate these. I had to alliterate them, and I didn't want to alliterate them with some random letter. I wanted to use the letter of my name, so they're all L's. So, number one would be lack of soul winning zeal. Lack of soul winning zeal. Now, I just want to ask you a question. How many zealous Christians do you see running around with the NIV, right? They're running around, they're like, can I show you the gospel? And you're like, sure, and they're like, out of the NIV in 1 John 5, 7, I gotta go. And they go... No, you don't see many people sowing with the NIV, do you? Because they, they couldn't quite preach the gospel out of it. There's a few verses missing in there. Maybe they could, but you don't see zealous sowers coming out of the NIV. Why? There's not the power there that there is in the Word of God. Is there not? Now, Theodore Roosevelt, I don't know how many of you have heard this story. He was scared of some, a monster in his church. There was a man-eating monster in his church, and he wouldn't go to church because of it. And his mom asked him, why are you not going to church, son? And he said, because of that monster. The preacher told us about it. He said, what? And so she read a bunch of verses about zeal. He was calling that monster zeal. He said, oh, that zeal is going to get me. And she finally found it. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That no, wasn't a monster. He kind of misunderstood that somewhere in there. But a lot of people who have the King James Bible, there's something in it that, that gives you zeal. Gives you zeal to share God's word that you don't quite get out of the NIV, the ESV. You know, you'll get life style evangelism out of it. You'll get a lot of laziness and not sharing the gospel out of those versions. But you won't find the zeal that's in the King James. You know, if you have a King James Bible, a lot of King James churches, what do they do? They go share it. I mean, I'm not pro buses and all. But still, those King James Bible churches, at least they're doing something. They're doing more than the other churches. You know, I'm not pro... Whatever they do, they have all these like kind of beat around the bush ways of doing it, right? But still, they're getting people saved. And you know, we do it just the right way. We go out door to door, just get them all, just go right at it, right? It's because we got the King James Bible. We're not going out there with the NIV because we don't want to go out with something that's not the Word of God. Why not use the perfect Word of God? So that's number one. A fruit of leaving God's Word is lack of sowing zeal. Why are you going to share something that's not God's Word? Number two, lifestyle evangelism. You see them forsake soul winning, and what do they go to? When they get this ESV, they go to the soul winning without soul winning. That's what I call it, the soul winning without soul winning. They're like, yeah, I'm sharing the gospel, living such a good life, mowing my lawn. You know, what do they do? Rake their yard, they keep their yard nice. They act, they're Mr. Nice Guy, and they're hoping somebody one day will be like, why, why, oh man? Are you so nice? Why did you pull out my chair for me? Why did you pay for my meal? And then they'll get a chance to share the gospel. Now, I've heard of it happening, but I might have only heard one or two instances in my whole life. I've never had it happen. And I dress pretty nice. I act like a nice guy. Still haven't had it happen. I'm waiting. So this lifestyle evangelism, you don't see much of it. It only happens a couple times in the Bible, right? Paul and Silas, right? They stay in the jail. Perfect example for lifestyle evangelism. And he comes to them and says, Sirs, what must they do to be saved? It works sometimes. That's why we're living a good life, right? We're living a good life to please the Lord and also as a testimony to men that they may see your conversation. But that's not our primary means. Primary means is when Jesus said go. When Jesus said go, that's primary means. He said, hey, get zealous and let's go. Let's go with the King James Bible. Let's go with the Word of God. Taking the Word of God to the sinners. Lifestyle evangelism is number two. Number one, lack of soul winning zeal. Number two, lifestyle evangelism. Lifestyle evangelism. The third fruit of leaving the Word of God for new versions would be laxity of standards. Laxity of standards. It's an odd phenomenon. I can't put my finger on it. But when you get the new versions, when you take those new versions and you put them in your church, when the Word of God leaves the church and we put it under a blanket over here, we, we're hiding the Word of God, right? And we get out this thing that's kind of, sort of, maybe partially the Word of God, but really isn't. That, that this random book 
called the NIV or whatever, the standards start dropping little by little. You know, I even heard in my college class, it was really bad. There was a version and it got rejected immediately. But these guys took out the seventh commandment. Does anybody know what the seventh commandment is? Oh, no. There we go. Thank you, Brother Doug. Thank you, Brother Doug. All right. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why is that there? Why is that there? God doesn't want us to just be running around with all kinds of wild women. He wants to stay one man, one woman. He didn't create Eve and 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 Eve. No, he created Adam and he created Eve. It should be two people. That's it. Two people. He put that commandment there for a reason. These guys had nine commandments. I am not joking. Nine commandments. Their Bible did not last long, thankfully. Thankfully, enough people were like, um, there's ten commandments in here. Uh, we're going to toss this Bible out. They named it some silly name, and they tossed it out, thankfully. But there are people out there that are taking the new versions, trying to drop the standards. And every church, you see short dresses, right? The rock show. You got the bad doctrine. They're not normally using the King James Bible, are they? What are they using? All the new versions. You know, if we were to switch to a new Bible, that would be our first compromise. First compromise. Once you make a compromise, another compromise is going to come, and another, and another, and another, and another, until you are as worldly as anybody else, right? You know, I was just playing tug of war with Brother Doug. That first step you take towards his direction is pretty much the last step of the game. After that, it's just you're coming over and over and over, and you lose the game. But if you start moving back and pulling Brother Doug this way, then he's compromising. And he comes all the way over and we beat him, thankfully. Whew, that was a, that, we're going to leave it at that, that time I beat you. Okay. Compromising. It happens. I'm telling you, we knew a family. We knew a family that was a multi-generational, homeschooling, dress wearing, King James only. They were everything like us. You know, they weren't quite as zealous on soul winning. I'll say that. But they were standard-wise hardcore. They were so hardcore, they wore head coverings. Now, I'm not totally pro head covering. But I'll tell you this. That's a higher standard than I have. They were going over and above. They were so hardcore. And you know what? The first compromise I ever saw them make, first compromise, was they went to the new versions. That's all they did. And they are, we argued with them long, long, long time. Argued and argued, had them over, they had us over. We talked and talked and talked and talked. That was the first compromise they ever made. First one I ever heard of. They went to the new versions. And, you know, he would make points like, ah, it's easier to understand. And we're like, just because it's easier to understand. I mean, just because this is, you might have to look, take a dictionary and learn some new words. Does that mean it's not the word of God? And he would go back and forth and he would say, you know, no doctrine has changed in the new versions. And we would say, yes, there is. In 1 John 5, 7, they take out the Trinity. And he'd say, yeah, you're right. Then he'd be like, but I still like the new versions. And so they used the new versions. And you know what? Nearly a year later, now they are wearing spandex short shorts. I've never, ever in my whole life, I've known in my whole life, I've never seen them wearing this. It's appalling. I'm just like, what? Who? What? Where? Why? First compromise I ever saw made was the new versions. Laxity of standards. Those standards we have are there because of God's word. God's word inspires us. It gives us a zeal. It teaches us to go soul winning. It teaches us to keep high standards, not to just live like the world. And you know, when you lose the word of God and you have this, instead of a sword, you got a butter knife, right? Then when the devil starts attacking, you're not going to be fighting so much as maybe defending or losing. And so you start moving back and back and back until you're just as worldly as the world. Because you don't have the word of God, so what are you going to use to defend you? You don't have a sword. Fourth is loose living. Loose living. Once you get a new version, something about it, the word of God is gone, and you start living more like the world. It goes along with laxity of standards. You know, I heard a quote, the type of behavior that once brought shame and disgrace now gets a book, a movie, or show a contract. Once, when the word of God was prominent in our country, people would say, that is wicked. And they wouldn't publish that movie, book, whatever. And now, since the word of God is kind of moving away and people don't read it as much, 
Now when they see that type of behavior, they go, oh, this movie, this book, it needs a contract. We need to publish this thing. It's going to be a hit. No. No. When you leave the Word of God, loose living, laxity of standards, lifestyle evangelism, lack of soul winning, number five, loud music. Loud music. It's weird. I'm just pointing out facts. These new churches, 1122, what do you got? You got celebration. I always wondered what they did there. I guess they celebrate. I don't know what they're celebrating because they don't got the word of God. But celebration, you got all these new churches. They have loud music. Loud music. You walk in, you're like, ah, it's so loud. Something about it. You know, remember when Joshua was coming down the hill with Moses? And he said, there's a, nor a noise of war in the camp. He didn't say, oh, they're having a church service. He didn't say, oh, is that some hymns I hear? Is that just some psalms, spiritual songs? No. What did he say? Noise of war. The loud music. The music when they don't have the word of God. When they're worshiping another god, the golden calf. What do they have? Loud music. They didn't have praise music to God. They had loud music that was boom, 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 drums, all kinds of crazy stuff. Noise of war in the camp. Now, number five, or number six, actually, starts with an M. No, I'm not going to start with an M. I've gone this far with L's, so I might as well keep it with L's. Liberal theology. This was a point that man made to my dad. He, you know, he had multiple, multiple kids. A, a lot of kids. More than us, which is a lot. And he, <laughs> I don't know, we don't have that many, do we? We've got to pick up the pace. We know people with 14 kids, so we've got to pick up the pace. Seriously, we're halfway there. All right. Liberal theology, though. When you get these new versions... He made the point that, you know, it doesn't change any of our theology. It doesn't change any doctrine. I mean, it just changes, you know, the these and the thousand to yous and yours. And no, it does. You know, it takes, instead of a son of God, or the son of God, Jesus Christ, it takes that in Daniel 3.25 and says, a son of the gods, indicating plural gods. There's only one God. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One God. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We know that verse. Now, let me ask you this. If it says a son of the gods, that would cause a contradiction. God can't lie. There we have a contradiction in the new Bible. We also have, they take out 1 John 5, 7, 8, taking out a primary passage for the Trinity. They don't want the Trinity in there, do they? No, they don't like the Trinity. That's, that's good, solid doctrine there. So we got to take that out of the Bible. What else do they take out? They take Genesis 1, 1. They mess with the very first verse of the Bible. Because you're going to mess up the first verse. I mean, how easy is it going to be to mess up the rest of the Bible if someone can't even believe in the first verse? Cause of a contradiction there. They mess up so much else. And I'm sure you guys have seen it. Liberal theology. You know, the new versions, they spill over and change our theology. You see all these new churches. You don't see many of them with the King James Bible. And they got some liberal, liberal theology. They got some new theology that you're thinking, where did you get that from? I mean, that sounds really weird. I mean, our theology is standing the test of time. We got Baptist theology. It is correct, founded on God's word. But these guys, they're coming out with some new stuff. And you're like, whoa, this is weird. Now, number seven, limp-wristed preaching. And I mean, this is a little bit silly, but make the point. How many people out there do you find giving sermons like Jesus gave, Paul gave, Peter gave, sermons that were strong with theology. They were delivered strong. The Holy Ghost impacted. They had a revival. 3,000 saved on a day. What was it? A lot saved on a day. 3,000 were added unto the church. Wow. That was some serious preaching, I got to say. Serious preaching that saves thousands and brings 3,000 to church. I mean, that's the type of preaching we need, right? Hellfire and brimstone preaching. Now, they take the word hell out of their Bible. So what is it? Shield, Hades, fire, and brimstone preaching. I don't know what they preach in their new churches, but they got some serious limp-wristed preaching when what we need is some strong, godly, invigorating revival preaching that will save souls. And they don't have any of that in their churches because they can't preach out of the word of God. They have these new versions, do they? Trust God's word. My last point would be trust God's word. Trust the King James Bible. Don't trust these new versions. God, God's word, it's inspired. It's preserved. It's preserved. Psalms 12, we read it at the beginning. Psalms chapter 12 and verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are as pure words, as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. 
Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Let me make this last point. He promises. He promises. God promises to man to preserve his word. There are over 8,810 promises in the Bible. If you're using the King James Bible, there is. I don't know how many there are in the other ones. They probably want to take this one out of the new versions. Probably want to take this promise out. There are a lot of promises. A lot of those has been fulfilled. The rest will be fulfilled at the second coming. The promise here is to preserve God's word. There are 7,487 promises from God to man. This is one of them. There are 290 promises from man to God. There are nine promises made by the devil himself. There are promises, two promises made by an evil spirit. There are two promises made by God, the Father, to God, the Son. And there is one book of the Bible that contains no promise even. Ephesians, for example, contains six promises in all. Now listen to this. God made us a promise. He promised to preserve his word. Seeing his track record so far, seeing his track record so far that he promises stuff and it, it comes to pass. What hasn't come to pass will come to pass. He promises that. I'm going to say God has preserved his word. I'm going to say he probably didn't preserve it in all these new versions where there's a bunch of flaws. He definitely did it. But he definitely did preserve his word somewhere. Where did he preserve it? He promises he will preserve his word and he did in the King James Bible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this chance to preach. I thank you for all the um, good soul winning we've had the last few weeks. I ask you to help soul winning uh, this Sunday and this Saturday. And Lord, um, please bless all the people who came out tonight. Please keep them all safe on the way home. Please help us to uh, trust in your promise that you will preserve your word and the King James Bible. Lord, help us to um, have faith in your word. Help us to go out and share your word zealously. And Lord, please uh, bless the fellowship afterwards. In Jesus' name, amen.